just lift the 14th verse. Believe in your hearing. Matthew 27. Chapter 27, verses 13. Um, matter of fact, let's read verses 12, 13, and 14. And the word of God reads that when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answers him, to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Talk about the power of silence. Amen. The power of silence. <clears throat> and when he was accused of the chief priests, plural, and elders, plural, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word. That's the King James Version rendering of it, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. The power of silence. Silence has an energy to it like no other or no other source. It has the power to get people to think and to act. It can help slow the mind down. And it is a powerful ally to the likes of counseling and life coaching. The trouble, however, with silence is that many people feel the need to fill the void of silence um, with noise of some kind. Silence can be disconcerting and can make people feel uncomfortable and alone. That's why the world is filled with TV or television that have been left on even when nobody's watching uh, for background noise. What happens when there is silence? We turn our thoughts and focus, and again, the power we need to refuel our minds, or we turn our thoughts and our focuses inward, um, and the power we need to refuel our minds. Our ego is temporarily switched off, or at least made to be quiet for a bit, um, and we start to see the real world as it is should be. Our thoughts get in the way of our reality sometimes and we don't see the beauty of the world around us. When there is silence, there is time for introspection, that is looking inwardly um, and to allow our true self to speak, not the ego or the conscious mind, but the true self connected to the flow of energy around us. <coughs> Let me share with you some examples of silence, or when to use silence, five to be exact. One is during an argument, or during arguments. Yeah. One of the best times to use the power of silence is during an argument. Uh, stay silent. The ego will be trying to force its way out of you and finish the argument, but you are the control, not the ego. Someone is shouting at you, looking for you to retaliate or looking for an argument yes. well, or just picking on you. All right. You can literally take all the power away from them and keep all your energy by simply looking at them and saying nothing. Amen. Now it's extremely difficult to do, but it's powerful. The second time, or a second time, 
to keep silent is in the midst of gossiping. There's a crowd of people in the workplace. There are gossipers who speak about other people. Thing with someone else, or the thing with gossiping is that it is contagious. Gossiping is contagious. When we don't like someone and someone else starts speaking about them, we naturally tend to voice our opinion. But try and stop yourself from catching the virus of gossiping. And use the power of silence whenever it occurs. If you are a gossiper yourself, and people around start to notice that you are not your usual self, don't give an explanation. Just leave saying you've got work to do or whatever. Pretty soon you'll be out of the gossiping loop. Just let people talk and you listen to them and use your facial expressions or your internal expressions as they are continuing to talk and your movements and uh, to acknowledge that you are listening. It can be tough to do sometimes, but silence is an extremely powerful force. It's powerful for you as well as the listener and the talker. Uh, you will find that as you practice this, more people come to talk to you as you will be known as a listener. Obviously, there are times when you should speak during the conversation. However, when you do, make sure it is to paraphrase what the talker is saying or asking questions to get more information. But make sure you don't make it about yourself. Now, when people want to know more about you, they'll ask you. Uh, a fourth time to keep silent is when the house is empty. The silence of the home can be quite disturbing to some people as there's a natural need to fill the void of something. We turn on the radio, play music, call friends or family, or turn on the TV to fill this void. Having a completely silent home when you are alone does not mean you are alone. Amen. It simply means you are recharging your mind and giving it some downtime. There are plenty of times when we need to put our minds and time out yes. and give our minds some downtime. Silence help us to work through in our minds the events of the day or project, what we want to happen during the day ahead. Um, some people are night owls and um, they love the silence when they know everyone is safe and tucked in the bed and uh, they can write, or they can work on the computer. Um, it's harder when you're alone, however times of silence can be used to think about the life you want and the workout ways mm -hmm. um, to get. Fifth and final time to keep silence is doing quiet reflection. It's a frantic way to connect with the world in a way that is not possible when you are surrounded by noise. Fifteen minutes in the morning, fifteen minutes in the evening, simply focusing on your breath uh, can do wonders for both your mind and your body. And I truly believe that with the practice of silence, quiet reflection can help us reach a level of deep inner calm. The state of silence is a way of reaching another part of your mind, not possible when going about your daily routine. Now, this other part of your mind is connected in every way to the world around you, and with practice, you can tap into the knowledge, the reservoir of knowledge that's there in your mind. Being exposed to the kind of world in which we live, with the advancement of technology and the advancement of automobiles, the advancement of electronics, we find ourselves um, overwhelmed with things to do, things to think about, things to consider, things to ponder, and people to work with. But what happens is that as our minds become overloaded with all of these things, we fail to make time for us. 
we fail to make time for ourselves because we are so accustomed to being uh, inundated with things and with people that you feel that the only way to connect to people and to be noticed and recognized is always be around people. But the truth of the matter is that you can be in the midst of a crowd and still be void, still be naked, still be empty, still feel that you are not complete, still feel that uh, you are not whole because there's something that's missing in your life. Some people are married and alone. Some people are in other relationships and still alone. Have a physical body in the house or in their lives other than themselves, but yet they are void, they're empty, they're incomplete and are in search of something or someone to feel that void. I'm suggesting to you today to spend some time alone and make sure that after you have turned off all of the other devices, that you leave your ears and your mind open to hear from the one who has reserved a special place in your heart, in your mind, at creation that's meant only for himself. And that person is Jesus Christ. The reason that the human being are in search for completeness and wholeness is because he was created to be whole. He was created to be complete. He was created to be full. He was created to be joyful. He was created to live and move and have his being. If you see somebody sleeping next to you, wake them up. We were created to enjoy the life that God has given to us. And the only way to enjoy that life is to know and enjoy the one who gave that life to you. Amen. Silence, when it is used in its right perspective, actually motivates us and gives to us a thrust and a thrive of energy that catapults us and promotes us to do well, to be aware of our surroundings because it takes place in our minds. And for the past few weeks, we've been talking about the mind, even in Bible study and from the pulpit, we've been talking about the mind and its importance. And last week we gave to you some statistics on uh, people in our country who suffer uh, from mental illnesses because of what's going on in their minds. And the conclusion is that um, aside from clinical reviews uh, and from clinical um, connotations, um, the mind is usually troubled because we fear what others think of us. We fear what others think about us. We fear what others' opinion or what the opinions of others are about us. But if within oneself he will seek the one who is really on the inside, who is at the core of our being, who is an, an, a wellspring of life to us, if we would seek him, he will fill all of our voids. Amen. Silence helps us to communicate uh, in a way that's not expressive vocally, but it helps us to be more observant of not only ourselves, but of others as well. Amen. Silence takes self-control. Yes. Wow. Silence requires that one uses his intellect to be intellectual. I'll say that again. Silence requires that one uses his intellect to be intellectual. You see, 
when we are always talking or always verbal, it's usually because there's something missing within us and we're trying to make ourselves known to others. We're trying to make sure that we are heard. But the most effective way to be heard and not seen is to be silent. Uh, Solomon addresses uh, the need to be silent in saying that one who talks too much is a fool. And you can't rationalize with a fool. You can't communicate with a fool. A fool thinks he knows everything. A fool cannot be reasoned with. A, a, a fool is one who doesn't know, but who does not know that he doesn't know. And the best thing to do when you're in the midst of a fool who will not listen is to stop talking. Keep silent. And let them talk on by themselves. Don't join the foolish category by becoming a fool yourself because you're surrounded with a fool or you're confronted by a fool. In the text, Jesus was being interrogated by the high priest, plural. As a matter of fact, Caiaphas, who at that time was uh, the chief high priest, was doing the questioning. Jesus had been taken before Pilate and then from Pilate to Caiaphas um, and Herod, who would give him uh, two hearings. And then he would have a trial uh, before Pilate, who was the procurator or the ruling governor of the Roman province at that time, and, and Pilate asked questions that were pertinent, in his opinion, to the release of Jesus. But in the passages that we lift in your hearing today, uh, Caiaphas raised questions. Jesus had been accused by his own people, by his own race, of being um, an imposter of one posing to be something that he was not. The thing that he posed to be was the Son of God. But in reality, he was not an imposter because he was, in fact, God incarnate. That means he was God in the flesh. He was God on earth. He was 100% God and 100% man. And his reason for becoming man in the flesh was to identify with man and to let man know that I'm going to exemplify before you how to live here, how to walk here, how to survive here on earth in your flesh. And I'm going to show you that you can rise above your storm and above your trials and above your tests. That was Jesus' purpose for coming, to seek and to save that which was lost. And in doing so, he would identify with man from a human standpoint. Man's tears, man's pain, um, man's confrontations, man's hunger. Uh, Jesus did not get sick because he spoke sickness away from him. But he did get lonely. He could feel man's pain. He could feel man's loneliness. He got hungry. He cried. The, John said Jesus wept. And when he had been asked the question by the chief priests and the elders, he said nothing. In other words, he kept silence. Pilate came to him and said, do not you not hear all of these many things that these people are witnessing against you. As a believer, as a Christian, you're going to be falsely accused. In life, it's, it's just a part of life in general, even if you're not a Christian, you're going to be falsely accused uh, of things that you have not done or of which you are not guilty. How do we respond when we know we are right in the sight of God? And listen, protecting your reputation is important, but not to the point of risking losing the reputation. Amen. 
Protecting your reputation is important, but not to the point of risking losing the reputation by actually acting out and proving your enemies to be right. Jesus set the example. He kept silent when they accused him. He kept silent. For many of those who accused him had not seen him or caught him in the act of anything. Amen. They were merely going by what they had heard others say. Isn't that like life in the church today? Yes. We yes. just hear somebody say something about somebody else and we take it to be factual. And then we say what we have heard to someone else. And before long, we have began to contribute to that seed of gossiping and, and, and spreading that which is negative to attack the character and personality and reputation of other people. But Jesus, during his teaching, said, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with the same judgment that you use to judge others, you yourself will be judged. Jesus was standing, but he wasn't standing alone because the Holy Spirit was undergirding him. So he said nothing. And when Pilate interjected, do you not hear all of these many things that these witnesses are saying against you? He did not say a word. You see, truth will always win over a lie. Amen. Truth will always win over that which is false. The late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, truth crushed to the ground, or truth crushed to the ground will rise again. Regardless of what others say, regardless of the opinions of others about you, when you know that you are in the will of God and that God is in you and you are being led by the Holy Spirit, there is nothing that can thwart your progress. There is nothing that can kill your productivity. There is nothing that can cause you to, to not reach your goals because if Jesus is with you, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So he answered him never a word. This reminds me of the teachings or the prophecy of the prophet Isaiah who before Jesus, some 700 years to be exact, prophesied of the fact that Jesus would be led before the slaughter. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was a